At Al Jazeera's investigative unit, we've conducted a forensic, meticulous examination of the events of October the 7th. We uncovered very real crimes committed by Hamas and others. But I think what was perhaps most significant were the crimes we discovered that did not happen. And it's hugely concerning that these revelations have been virtually entirely ignored by the Western press. What's extraordinary is the Israelis were aware of the plans. Hamas were actually training quite openly for this operation, and they were actually placing the training videos online so anyone could view them. On the very night of October the 7th, before dawn, spotters along the fence are reporting back to headquarters, and the head of Shin Bet and the head of military intelligence take this seriously enough that in the middle of the night, they're up and talking to each other, and they conclude it's just another training exercise. And what is extraordinary is that they don't even raise the alert level to number one. You know, the most basic alert level would have made a huge difference. And they don't do that, which means that when Hamas bursts through the fence at 6.30 in the morning, they catch many of the defenders in their beds. I mean, you can see many of the soldiers are killed in their beds. Hamas had anticipated most of their fighters would be killed trying to get through the fence. In fact, only a small number were killed trying to get through the fence. They were as much taken by surprise as anyone by the performance of Israeli intelligence and the Israeli military. Crucially also, they were taken by surprise by this very large music festival that was taking place, which they don't seem to have been aware of. Having over on the military bases, the game plan was to grab hostages and take them back. And they do this on a large scale, but they also clearly kill very large numbers of, of unarmed civilians as well. The Israelis were then extraordinarily slow to respond. Now, they scramble Apache helicopters, but there's no ground control. It's pretty clear that in the chaos, some hostages at least were hit by Apache helicopter fire. We've identified 27 people who were clearly taken hostage, taken captive, and were taken away from their homes, but never made it to the fence, died somewhere between their homes and the fence. There's a fair chance that a number of them were killed by Apache helicopters. Within the kibbutzes, we've identified 18 people who were pretty much certainly killed by the police and the army as they arrived. 12 of them, a specific incident in Kibbutz Beri, where you have a large number of gunmen, around 40 gunmen, holed up in a house with 13 hostages. A tank is brought in and, and opens fire on the house. There are two survivors from this incident, which is why we know about it. There may be other incidents we don't know about because everyone was killed, but there are two survivors from this who spoke to Israeli media. There's a common sense thing. You just have to look at the scale of the destruction, and it's clear that 1,200 men armed with rocket-propelled grenades and machine guns did not do all of this. The Hannibal Directive which was something that was developed in the 1980s by the Israelis, and it was basically to avoid situations where their enemies would capture one or two or three Israeli soldiers and then effectively hold them to ransom. There was one occasion where the Israelis released over a thousand Palestinian prisoners in return for a single Israeli soldier. So an order was issued whereby they said, it's better that we kill everyone than allow people to be captured. Now this was supposedly rescinded several years ago, but at midday on October the 7th, the army revived the Hannibal Directive, put it into effect. 70 vehicles were hit. At least in some of the cases, everyone in the vehicle was killed. The Israeli military does not deny the report. The peculiarity of the days after October 7 is that the Israeli media and subsequently the international media choose to focus not on the very real and extensive crimes that Hamas and others did commit, but on crimes they did not commit. And this had two focuses. In the days immediately after, it's to do with babies. So the most dramatic one is we see an allegation that there were 40 babies killed, many of them beheaded. This is very simple to deal with because we have a comprehensive list of the dead. We know that two babies are killed on October the 7th. One is a 10-month-old child who is hit by a bullet fired through a safe room door. The other is a child who dies after an emergency caesarean, a Bedouin child, in fact. Now, any story about babies that does not relate to those two, and there are a lot of stories about babies, is not true. We know it's not true. This has enormous implications for the other wave of atrocity stories that began very quickly, which is to do with sexual violence, and particularly the Israeli assertion that it was widespread and systematic. To be clear in the film, we are not saying that there were no rapes on October the 7th. We simply don't know. What we are saying is that there simply is not the evidence 
There's not the forensic evidence, there's not the visual evidence, there's not the photographic evidence, and there is not the witness evidence to support the allegation of widespread and systematic rape. The Israelis have this strange system where they farm out the collection of bodies after disasters and terrorist attacks and so on to an organization called Zaka, who are ultra-Orthodox religious volunteers. They collect the bodies, prepare them for religious burial and so on. A character that many people will have seen in the days afterwards is Yossi Landau, who was the southern commander of Zaka, who was on television a great deal. He said it. The two piles of 10 children each were tied to the back, burned to death. You then see a phone call which Netanyahu makes to President Biden, where he repeats this story. In fact, he embellishes it. They took dozens of children, bound them up, burned them, and executed them. Terribly important this, because it was entirely untrue. We know the house he's talking about. He's talking about the house in Kibbutz Beri, which was the house that was stormed by Israeli police and military, and where it is almost certain that all of the hostages were killed by the Israeli police and military. There were two children there, two twins, but no other children, so we know the story is untrue. Mr. Landau told a number of other stories. There's one particularly notorious one about the fetus being cut out of a pregnant woman. The baby that was connected to the court was stabbed, and she was shot in the back. We simply know this is untrue. The list of the dead show there's no such victim. Mr. Landau said, you know, I have a picture of this atrocity. If you want to see the picture, I have the picture of it. This is the baby. I'm sorry to be graphic here, but I, I can't see a baby here. You can't see the baby because, but this is the picture of the, of the mother. It was a piece of charred flesh. It wasn't a baby. It certainly wasn't a baby. So it was interesting. And psychologically, I'm not quite sure why he offered to show me a photo that he didn't have. I'd point out as well that Zaka was an organization that was in trouble. There had been a major scandal. Its founder had been accused of child sexual abuse. There was a financial scandal. It had been found to be cooking the books. It's raised an awful lot of money since October the 7th. These stories were clearly useful, and they were useful to the Israeli government. In the film, we see Benjamin Netanyahu visiting Zaka volunteers and thanking them for talking to the world's media and stressing that this is another front in the war. <laughs> Why does this matter? Why does it matter whether this type of atrocity was committed, but not that type? People were killed in this way, not that way. It matters because the murder of babies and widespread rape has a particular resonance. It's particularly triggering the Israeli government and its supporters when they justify the brutality of the subsequent bombardment and invasion of the Gaza Strip again and again and again, what they always reference is babies and rape. Young girls who were raped and then murdered. Women brutally raped and murdered. Little kids who are beheaded. Pictures of terrorists beheading children. These bastards put these babies in an oven and put on the oven. We found the kid a few hours later. This is something you see in previous conflicts as well. If you want to dehumanize an enemy, if you want to desensitize people to the suffering that is inflicted on that enemy, then you portray them as barbarians, basically as savages, as people who are not deserving of humane treatment. And that's why it's relevant. That's why it's important to pick apart. A lot of the world's leading media outlets have done in-depth investigations where they have concluded there was widespread, systematic, instrumentalized, weaponized rape. The New York Times makes a particular feature of the story of a young woman. She was killed early in the morning, nine miles north of the music festival site as she and her husband were fleeing. The New York Times, in its big December investigation into sexual violence, leads with this, and about a third of the article consists of her story. And it's immediately undermined because the woman's sister then posts on Instagram immediately afterwards, this isn't true, we know she wasn't raped. She was texting us until minutes before her death. It's also the case that her husband had a lengthy phone conversation immediately after her death with his brother, and again, made no mention of rape. So it's very important that because it's the central, most compelling piece of information in one of the biggest investigations done by one of the world's most prestigious media outlets, the New York Times, and it turns out not to be true. It's done by three journalists. One of them turns out to be somebody who had worked in some capacity for Israeli intelligence previously, who has virtually no journalistic experience, and then who had liked uh, genocidal media posts. It's very interesting with Anna Schwartz. She gives an interview in Hebrew to an Israeli 
channel, she actually lays out how difficult they were finding it to find evidence that they, they were talking to all the hospitals and all the psychiatric clinics and so on, and that there was simply no evidence at all. There were no witnesses had come forward, no, no victims had come forward at all. I think she's telling this as if to, to show what digging they had to do, but it's actually very revealing. In the end, it's quite clear they fall back on the same sources as everyone else, Israeli government officials, IDF officers, and first responders, all sources which were discredited by the baby stories. So no babies were beheaded, no babies were, were thrown into ovens, and there is no real evidence for widespread and systematic rape. Now, it's very clear why the Israelis might want these stories to, to circulate. What's less clear is why very reputable Western news and media outlets should swallow them so uncritically, particularly given the track record of the Israeli government and the IDF, which has been shown again and again and again in the past to have been less than truthful in the accounts it gives. Because our war is against Hamas, not against the people of Gaza. While this mission is urgent, we will continue to fulfill it with care and with a commitment to the sanctity of life, both Israeli and Palestinian. The response to our film, October the 7th, has been interesting. The response is not to criticize and to pick apart and say, we've got it wrong. Uh, they don't do that at all. What they do is they simply ignore you, which on one level I take as a compliment, because I think there are all sorts of people out there who would very much like to pick apart what we're doing and to destroy it and discredit it. And I think they take one look at it and decide they can't really do it. So what they do do, which in a way is even more damaging, is just to entirely ignore us. This is significant because so often what we are doing is critiquing the way the mainstream media has covered the story, which may well be, of course, precisely why the media doesn't want to look at what we've done. So in a way, the treatment of this in many ways echoes the treatment of our earlier series, The Labour Files, which offered a critique of the dominant media narrative about Corbyn and the Corbyn years on the anti-Semitism crisis. The allegation of anti-Semitism clearly is a very powerful weapon that can be wielded in defense of the Israeli state. I think sometimes, particularly by the Israeli state, it is wielded very cynically and very deliberately. When the ICC investigates Israel for fake war crimes, this is pure anti-Semitism. It's not the case in Western media and Western societies that you cannot criticize Israel. You can. Now, you have to be a bit careful about how you do it. But certainly at the moment, during the assault on Gaza, you certainly can. What you cannot do is to question the fundamental philosophy of Zionism. What you are not allowed to do is to say what all Palestinians would say. Israel is a state whose defining feature is and has always been that it is structured to ensure the domination of one ethnicity over another, that it is in effect an apartheid state, which is what all of the world's human rights organizations now describe it as. The enormous peculiarity and dysfunction of Western media with Israel is not only does it not say that, you're actually not allowed to say that. And this renders criticism of Israel perilous terrain. People are very on edge. They're very aware that they're straying into dangerous territory. They're very aware they have to choose their words terribly carefully, otherwise they will be misconstrued. You can see this happening at its worst within the Labour Party, where particularly Jewish people are far, far more likely to be suspended and expelled for anti-Semitism from the Labour Party than non-Jewish people. But there is something more fundamental that goes on, which regards the Palestinian people as a whole. Once you have tainted them with the stain of anti-Semitism, you have opened the door to, you have facilitated the dehumanization of Palestinians, which is the psychological prerequisite of Israeli brutality towards the Palestinians and of Western complicity in that brutality. Palestinians will often make the point that they did not choose who their occupier was, who their colonizer was. So in fighting back, yes, they are in inevitably fighting back against Zionists and Jews. It doesn't mean they're anti-Semitic. One has to ask oneself the question, are we really saying that if they had been colonized by Greeks or Italians, they wouldn't be resisting their occupation? Of course they would. 36 Israeli children were killed on October the 7th, and this understandably got widespread international media coverage. At this stage, I think over 14,000 Palestinian children have been killed. And you would expect the outrage and the coverage to be proportionately greater, and it's not.
in future people will look back at what is being done, which is essentially the flattening of a whole series of towns and the mass murder of thousands and thousands of unarmed civilians, almost half of whom are children. And they will be absolutely bewildered by how the West allowed this to happen under its very noses with weapons that were being supplied by the West. There is a rupture in the relationship of large numbers of people with the political media class. There is a fundamental alienation that is going on right now as a result of what is happening in the Gaza Strip. I think that's very dangerous for the future. Hello, I'm Peter Oborn, columnist for Middle East Eye, and we have with us today Richard Sanders, the film director who made the new Al Jazeera documentary, October 7th. It's a very harrowing and educational film based on an enormous amount of material. How long did it take you to make that film? Um, well, I started work on it at the end of October. I did a week or two of development work on it so at the end of October. Uh, then we, we had the whole team up and running early November. And then we were pretty much done by the end of, of February. There, there was Christmas within that, but we worked through Christmas for the most part. So close to four months. And the stuff you had to, all that, it was, must have been harrowing for you going through the terrible things that happened on that day. Well, yes, so we unearthed about seven hours of footage, close to seven hours of, of footage. Um, quite a lot of footage which is from the head cams of, of dead Hamas fighters, uh, which the Israelis um, had, had released. Um, Hamas's own videos, which are of course edited, dash cam footage, CCTV footage, and of course inevitably people's phones. You know, something like this 40 years ago, we'd have probably virtually no images of it at all. But the, these days, everything leaves such, a, such an imprint. So, you know, as, as you see in the film, you can see it happening. Um, my colleague spent a long time. He, I had a colleague who, who really put the work into drawing up a list of the dead, because that was very important to sort of forensically get the numbers and look at the circumstances of each death and really start to, to pick that apart. We based it at Ynet and, and Haaretz had their own lists and we combined them and then researched around that. But that, that was an awful lot of work as well. But that was very important work because it enabled you to say definitively, for example, that just two babies were killed on the, uh, that day, and in the light of the the, 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 the the stories which went around the world that 40 babies had been beheaded, and you were able just to say two babies were killed and, and describe the circumstances in which that happened. That, that's right, it's, it's enormously important. I mean, you know, I'd never say only two babies were killed. You know, that, obviously that's a tragedy in, in itself, but the, the, the two babies that died, one was shot uh, they, they fired a bullet through the door of a safe room and it hit the baby. The other, the, the mother was hit and there was an emergency caesarean and the, and the baby died. So the important thing about the babies is that any story about babies, which is not about those two specific cases, you know it's not true. And what's interesting there is that there were a lot of stories about babies, usually multiple babies, cold-bloodedly murdered, and then mutilated, burned, and so on. And you know this isn't true, because you can simply compare it against the list of the dead. Um, and that's enormously important, because that immediately flags up to you there is a problem with accounts that come from Israeli government officials, Israeli army officials, and first responders. And I think this was the thing that the media here struggled with for a while, is, you know, wh why wouldn't you believe first responders? I mean, if you turn up at an accident or a tragedy in, in England and the, the ambulance man says this to you, you don't think, well, you know. Um, uh, and I think this was a problem that it took, it took British media a while to realize, hold on, you, you have to double check what, what a lot of these first responders are saying. And these stories, though, are going on. You're still getting senior Israeli people uh, saying, and the British press, talking about burned babies, aren't yeah. you? Uh, the, the, the babies thing, um, doubts began to creep in fairly quickly, and the, the 40 babies, most of whom were beheaded, was, was discredited. But the lie gets out there first, and then the awareness that this is unreliable is, is much slower to spread. So I think there's still an awful lot of people out there who believe there was the mass killing of babies. Um, although the media has pushed back on that a little. The, the, the issue of sexual violence and, and widespread and systematic rape, which is what the Israelis claim, is slightly different in that the really 
until very recently, the, the Israeli narrative there was pretty much accepted uncritically. And we really, you know, our film and the work of one or two other people really is just the beginnings of pushing that back against that. In the last few days, and we, we can talk about this more, the last few days that you, you can see the beginning of a broader unraveling of that narrative. It should be very interesting, uh, some, uh, somebody like me who follows the, these things without intense detail, Tell us about, just describe factually what's gone on with that New York Times story. So the New York Times story, this was a lot of media outlets around the world, the New York Times, the Guardian, the BBC, all did big in-depth investigations into sexual violence and basically echoed the Israeli claim that it was widespread, systematic, instrumentalized, weaponized, you know, a, a, part, of, a part of strategy. Now the New York Times one, Screams Without Words, it was entitled, um, it begins with the story of a young woman who, who died nine miles north of the music festival site. Her body was filmed the following night. It's lying by the main roadside um, where it had, she'd been killed, you know, more than 12 hours before. Um, and, and, you know, basically it's very clear, it's very graphic. A film, she's not wearing any underwear. Now, obviously this is heavily blurred in the version we use and, and that other people have used. Um, now, in, frankly, in the absence of much other visual evidence, I took this one very, very seriously, and, and we looked into this fairly carefully. And the, um, the New York Times made it the, 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 the opening part of their story, and about a third of the story relates to this, and they had a picture of the woman's family. And immediately the New York Times published, the family came out and said, hold on, we know she wasn't raped, and you didn't tell us you were doing a story about sexual violence. She was texting us until a few minutes before she died. Also, her husband, who was with her, got on the phone to his brother immediately after she died and had quite a lengthy phone conversation with him and no mention of rape at all. So, you know, this, which was really one of the strongest cases and the ones that where a lot of the visual evidence, it looked pretty vague to me, um, but that, you know, this did look stronger. It immediately evaporated, and that, that, was a, that was a real problem for the New York Times. That was the, the core of the story. Now, subsequently, and just in the last couple of days, the New York Times itself has reported that another of the stories that it told about two sisters who were found, who, in, in a way that suggested they'd been raped, that this story was entirely untrue as well. They, video has now emerged of their, the discovery of their bodies, and this is entirely untrue as well. And the New York Times itself is reporting that perhaps in an attempt to to regain some credibility, but the, so the the New York Times, which it attracted a lot of attention, came out just after Christmas. That story has really unravelled, and then you know the revelation um, that one of the authors of it had worked for Israeli intelligence, um, you know, which was rather odd as well. But I'd like to draw attention to the BBC's piece. Actually, the BBC did a piece on the fifth of December, where again it it, it entirely reproduces the Israeli narrative. And again, when you read it carefully, it, it depends entirely on Israeli government officials, um, Israeli army officials, and first responders. Okay, again, it's incredibly thin, the, the direct evidence. Now, just that, that BBC article, which no one really has focused on, um, there, there is an interview with a woman called Kochav el Khaim Levi, who had set up the Civic Commission to investigate um, sexual violence on October the 7th. We were becoming profoundly skeptical of her. There were, there were various things about her that rather worried us, but the BBC relied heavily on her. In the last few days, um, there has been reporting in Israel that the Israeli government is distancing itself from her. The Civic Commission she set up was always a rather odd thing. I mean, was it a government body? No. In that case, what was it? I mean, it turns out it was her on a website for which she has raised $8 million, apparently. Um, so she's a, you know, she is a, a witness that is emerging as being, or, um, or a voice that is emerging as being very problematic. Um, the, and then also, and this really is extraordinary, the BBC speaks at length to May Golan, who is the Israeli Women's Empowerment Minister, and you know, has a lot of harrowing quotes from Megalan. Megalan is a right-wing member of a very right-wing government. Um, she's on record as saying she is a proud racist. She has subsequently said that she is proud of the ruins of Gaza. I mean, to present this woman 
neutrally as if she is some conventional Western politician without any contextualizing at all, to present her as someone who can be trusted in what she says about Palestinians is extraordinary by the BBC, quite, quite remarkable. And, and that, you know, all the focus has been on the New York Times piece, but really that December the 5th BBC piece and the, and the reporting The Guardian has done, you know, really bears some scrutiny as well. So the BBC, um, have, they, have they had these points made to them? Are they showing any signs of having to re-examine re no, their no. reporting? I mean, alternative media made these points on online, in social media, as always happens. You know, I think it was the grey zone said, well, hang on, May, this is who May Golan is. Are you really going to quote her with no context whatsoever? But within mainstream media, no, no pushback at all. Do you think the BBC ought to re-examine its report? Yes, I think it should. I mean, I think everyone's going to have to re-examine um, uh, that. It was, it was an extraordinary example of, of groupthink. And you know, I think for understandable reasons, no one wants to deny sexual violence. For far too long in conflict situations, sexual violence w was ignored and people didn't take it seriously enough. And you know, I think a lot of the work that has been done over the last 20, 30, 40 years is enormously important. So no one you know, wants to be on the wrong side of that argument. Equally, there is a, a very strong tradition of the demonization of men of color by portraying them as sexual predators. And I think the, the fear that actually that was part of what was going on here ought to have kicked in a bit sooner with some, some media. Um, Human Rights Watch, very, very serious, a respectable human rights organization is doing the nearest thing there is to a thorough independent investigation into the events of um, October the 7th. And uh, my understanding is their report will be out in a couple of months, and I, I think it'll be very important to look at that. Yeah, as you say, I mean, sexual violence, it, there is a danger, isn't there, that it gets overlooked or misunderstood or um, there's some kind of, se you know, something about it which men like you or me might under... under, yeah. under and uh, traditionally people have, you know, that people yeah, yeah. Have, have played down or, you know, not taken seriously enough. But it was very interesting, the last few days, we were beginning to see quite detailed accounts of sexual violence against Palestinian women by Israeli soldiers. And now, of course, the same applies. Uh, an independent investigation must look into this. You, you, you don't just accept people's uh, allegations, um, you know, without probing them. But immediately, the, that stuff feels to me more tangible and concrete. I mean, you know how it is with a story, and it was the same with the anti-Semitism thing in the Labour Party. When you're trying to pin a story down, and the closer you get to the heart of the story, the vaguer it appears, and the the, the more, the more um, harder it is to, to get the concrete outlines of a story. And already with the allegations of rape against Palestinian women, it feels more tangible and concrete. In, in that context, I was struck by the uh, one of your interviewees in, in your film, Madeline Rees of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, where she um, put it rather well, didn't she? She didn't try and claim there had been no sexual violence, but she simply said, well, what, did, what did she tell Yeah, so the, the key point Madeline was making was quite possibly there will have been sexual violence. In fact, she, she suspects there will have been, uh, simply because there always is. You know, young men with guns given license to behave badly is what they do. Um, but she made the point that for widespread and systematic sexual violence, there just is nothing like sufficient evidence. You, know, you would expect far more evidence. I mean, just a very, very quick thing. You know, this music festival, which is where the rapes, uh, well, almost all the allegations of rape center on, it's an outdoor festival, okay? Now, hundreds of people are killed at that festival. Thousands are not. You know, there's a lot of people, most people survive. These rapes are supposedly happening out in the open. Where, where are the witnesses? You know, there's a couple of witnesses, one of whom's anonymous. You know, immediately, and I, I know sometimes people are traumatized, sometimes people don't speak for a long time, and I, I understand all that, but it's odd that there aren't more witnesses. It's, it's very odd. Now, now Madeline, I, I was enormously grateful to Madeline Reese. You know, I'd spoken to a number of people within international women's organizations who, who were angry, frankly, at the bullying that was going on by the Israeli government and, and people who support the Israeli government. You know, and, and, and people have to confront threats to their funding, you know. 
And I spoke to a number of people who were not prepared to go on camera, and I absolutely understand why they weren't prepared to go on camera. I, I get it. I know why they weren't prepared to go on camera. But Madeline was, and I'm enormous. She, she was not only very articulate and, and, and very clear, um, but also simply to have the courage to put her head above the parapet is enormously brave in this context. The next point which you make towards the end of your film, of course, is that the what, what was going on with these very lurid and terrible stories being promoted right from the word go by Israeli sources and absolutely amplified in the global media, particularly the British and American media, I should think, is the, um, what, was, what, what is the effect of it? And one of, your, one of your witnesses, Mark Owen Jones, talked very eloquently about the consequences of this course, kind of apparently fabricated discourse. Yes, so it's very important to say our film is not an apologia for Hamas and other people who, who followed them through the fence. We're absolutely clear that widespread and, and horrific human rights abuses were committed on the 7th of October. We're absolutely, absolutely clear about that. What we're, what we're saying is that the, the stories that were reported for the most part, the, the wholesale slaughter of babies, uh, widespread systematic rape, were not true. And this isn't pedantry. This isn't saying, oh, people died in this way, not that way. Those stories are enormously important, the babies, the rapes, because when the Israelis and their supporters are called on to justify the ferocity of the response, uh, which has killed far, far more people than the you know, original Hamas incursion. When they're called upon to justify that response, again and again and again, they will talk about babies and they will talk about rapes. Um, it's apps, and, and you see this in other historical situations where the same thing happens. When you need to justify savage repression of a group, um, if you can dehumanize them, if you can reduce them to the level of savages, uh, to the level of people who are not part of the family of humanity, then it's much easier to slaughter them, you know, to carry out the wholesale slaughter of them. And that, uh, and, and, and stories about the, the murder and, and mutilation of babies and, and of, of widespread and systematic rape do that. They, they, they serve a purpose, which is why it's important. It's not pedantry. We're not saying, well, they died in this way, not in that way. It's very important. Um, the fact that those stories were not true. I remember reading the, the, the in the days when the after the lurid the headlines, you suddenly got a, a certain uh, withdrawal of, of the story. But the 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 papers would say, oh, well, it's still look. I mean, it, how they were killed doesn't matter. The fact is, they were, and it was barbaric. Who's anybody who tries to sort of quibble about the details, really there's something wrong with them. Yes, I mean, with babies, that was particularly, so does it matter if they were beheaded or just shot? I mean, the point was, that the, 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 you know, they, they weren't killed in anything like the numbers that was being claimed, and there was no mutilation going on. It is different. I mean, two babies who are killed, um, you know, I, I don't want to belittle it. If you, 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 you shoot a bullet through a door where there might be a family on the other side, you, you know, you, you are responsible for the fact that that bullet has hit a baby. Um, the, the, the Bedouin woman, in fact, who was shot, she was in her car, at a, you know, they were just fired at the car. You know, that, you know it's not to uh, excuse people, but they were, it was not the cold-blooded murder of someone standing over a baby and then taking the decision to, to, to kill it. Um, so, you know, it, it was significant. The, these stories were not true, it was important. And it informs then, of course, the genocidal language, yeah. which you start yeah. to get, again, very quickly yeah. from leading military, human animals, yeah. for instance, comparisons of ISIS, yeah. I think we started to get at that yeah. stage. And Marco Rubio says in our film, you, you, can't, you can't negotiate with these savages. And so you're just framing a situation where the only, op only option is just to kill, really. And, and it's, it's profoundly important psychologically and emotionally. Um, people just do relate very differently to the suffering of people they have decided are savages than they do to, to the suffering of people who are like us. You know what I mean? It, it, it plays a very important role. Of course, one other point, you know, the, these stories of mass rape and the um, beheading of babies and, uh, has, ha, have therefore, one might, is it, pos is it fair to say, licensed or created a situation where 9,000 women have been killed, none of them competents? Yeah, that's right. I mean, most of the victims in the Gaza Strip 
are women and children. In fact, a peculiarity of the casualty statistics we produce, which no one has picked up on actually, is that more women are dying than men. Now that, that, well, more women are being reported dead than men, which might be the peculiarity of who it is that makes it to a hospital. I mean, the, the death toll in Gaza at the moment is a massive underestimate because of, you know, there are so many bodies under the rubble, so many, um, so, it's, 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 you know, and they, they simply can't count the, the dead anymore. But, um, so the death toll, that's interesting, so the death toll so far, which is 32,000 approximately. Well, that, that's the confirmed dead. It'll be much higher than that. And that is confirmed. Go, go, go through the, you looked at the, these procedures. Well, this is from, her, the, you know, the, the, the health ministry's figures. Yeah. Now, again, this is a thing, the, the, um, the Western media always says the Hamas-controlled health ministry. The, the World Health Organization, the Lancet, the Washington Post, Human Rights Watch, they've all done thorough analysis of the, the Gazan Health Ministry's figures and looked at previous conflicts, and they're, they're absolutely reliable. They're absolutely reliable. There is no need to be attaching this, this sort of health warning to them. And so, no, I mean, we, we take our figures from the Gazan Health Ministry because there's, there's no reason not to. The, the key thing to say about those figures is they will be a massive underestimate. You know, a lot of bodies are still under the rubble. The Israelis have been attacking hospitals. It's, you know, it's, it's become harder and harder to actually just keep the bureaucracy of health going and counting the dead. But also when they produce the lists of the dead, and so you'll know more, more about this than me. So Arabic names, all, 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 all Arabic people have four names, and you have the, and included in that is the father's name and the grandfather's name. Um, and you also have the identity card number. So it's extraordinary that the health ministry was continuing to be able to produce these figures, but they're also very, very checkable. And in past conflicts, um, outside organizations like the World Health Organization and so on have gone back and checked them and found them to be absolutely reliable. That just, just while I'm on it, actually. The other thing that is always said is um, Hamas hides behind civilians, okay? Now, it's well worth going back and reading the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International reports for 2009 and 2014 when similar things happened. And they, they don't uncover a, a widespread pattern of Hamas using human shields. In fact, th there is... There is you know, good evidence that the Israelis use uh, Palestinian civilians as, as human shields. And again, this is just repeated every time on British media with no one pushing back at all. It's worth saying, actually, in this context, you have extensive um, experience of reporting from Iraq, for instance. Yes, on Iraq 20 years ago, it was exactly the same. Everyone said that the, the Fedayeen were hiding behind civilians, and I went to all the places where all the battles took place, and I knocked on doors. And they, they, it just wasn't true. It just wasn't true. One question I'd like to ask you, I mean, what's been the reaction in the Western media to your very powerful film? It's been entirely ignored. It's been absolutely ignored. It uh, hasn't been picked up at all, which, which we rather expect. I mean, it's very odd, though. They, they, they work on the assumption that if they don't pick it up, no one knows about it. But these days, you know, with social media, um, you know, these things have widespread circulation and people are aware of it and people notice people notice that the BBC and The Guardian and so on are not telling these stories. And it's, uh, it's, it's a problem, you know, it's a problem in that, you know, to a degree and, and by degrees and gradually and slowly these, the, these institutions lose, lose credibility. And the, the, the figures for the, the public's confidence and faith in the BBC are terrifying. You see, quite a lot of what you did was newsworthy. For, above all, perhaps, that it, you know that your your discrediting of of the testimony of Yossi Landau. Yeah. That's hugely hugely newsworthy. It couldn't be more newsworthy. I mean, I, I think it's worth. I, I just want to say here that the sexual violence thing, in particular, is a case study in the absolute abject failure of traditional media. You know, we've talked about The Guardian, the BBC, and The New York Times, but there were many others as well. And the research here has been entirely dependent on independent media. And I think it's, it's important to name them, because to a degree, I piggyback on them. I mean, we, we, we were doing our own very important research as well, uh, in parallel to them. But, but you know, they, they were doing invaluable stuff. We're talking Mondovise, we're talking Grey Zone, we're talking Electronic Intifada, we're talking The Intercept, uh, and we're talking Yes Magazine. To, to some extent, had its newspaper in, in Israel as well. You know, to, to actually grasp the truth 
of what happened, particularly on the sexual violence issue, you had to read those outlets. You, you couldn't possibly rely on, on traditional media. The Times of Israel had some interesting stuff I read about the Hannibal Doctrine. Well, the, 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 the Israeli media has filled a gap where, Israel, where, where Israeli lives are, are the issue. So the Hannibal Doctrine, the, this um, practice traditionally the Israeli military has had of rather than allowing two, three, four soldiers to fall into enemy hands and become bargaining trips, they say, kill everyone, kill everyone, you know, which is clearly something that they've done in the past with soldiers. Um, the reporting in Yediot Aronot, Israeli newspaper, um, was that at midday on the 7th, the, the Israeli military issued a, a variation of the Hannibal Directive. And we, we've examined um, gun camera footage from Apache helicopters in great detail, and there's also stories of, of when the army and the, the anti-terrorism police entered the kibbutzes uh, of their behavior, and it's clear this is the case. Now, um, and again, the running has been made there by Israeli media. I mean, Israeli media has not been good on the babies' stories. It's not been good on the sexual violence stories. But on, on the issue of where Israeli lives are concerned, they have been good, and they've made the running largely ignored uh, in the West. Just want to say there, there is, there has been a tendency on social media to, for people to pick up that story and run with it and say most of those who died on, on October the 7th were killed by the Israeli army. It's not, it's not true. I mean, I think a significant number were killed by the Israeli army, but it's, it's not half or, or even anything remotely close to half. Just uh, your, your film has the numbers, and if they're on your head, you might just go through them. How many people were killed? Because originally it was 1,400, wasn't it, the Israelis initially said. What do, what do we now, just break down the numbers. Yeah, well. so we, we um, have, um, yeah. we, we break it down in our film, and it's, it's a little under 1,200 in the end. The, 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 the number the Israelis ended up with isn't, isn't wildly inaccurate. Um, I think it's 782 of them um, are civilians. 36 of them are children, uh, 13 of them are children under uh, the age of, of 12. Um, in terms of the friendly fire, because there seems to be a great appetite to put specific numbers on this, so let me make this very clear. We reckon 18 people are almost certainly killed by Israeli ground troops. Uh, we know at least one person is killed by helicopter fire. Um, on helicopter fire, we identify 27 other people who are taken hostage, taken away from their homes, but are dead before they reach the fence, and we just don't know how they died. Um, there was a lot of amateurism in the way the bodies were collected and recorded, which is a big problem, which we'll, we'll never be able to ob overcome. You can't replace that information. So of those 27 dead, you know, it's quite possible a fair number were killed by Apache helicopters. We just don't know. Um, with ground troops, I have a suspicion a number of people were killed in cars as they ran into roadblocks. Again, we can't know because they're all dead. Um, I, I, my guess would be, I mean, again, going back to Iraq 20 years ago, that was happening all the time. The Americans were shooting people running into roadblocks. Um, within the kibbutzes, you, you know, you look, look at Kafar Azza and Kibbutz Beri and, and so on, and the media was full of pictures of these kibbutzes, kibbutzim in the days after October the 7th. And you just have to look at them and think, well, hold on, the, the, the Hamas fighters had sidearms and they had rocket propelled grenades, but they didn't have anything that would do that. Um, and it's clear the Israelis came in very aggressively and a lot of houses were destroyed by the Israelis. Now, I'm sure, you know, on the whole, they would have taken care to check there weren't hostages in there. But we know from various stories that that wasn't always the case. A lot of bodies are discovered under the rubble of houses and we just don't know how they died. So we have this figure of 18 people. We are, you know, we're almost certain are killed by Israeli ground forces as they go into the kibbutzim. But the actual figure will be a fair bit higher than that. But again, not, not, you know, we're not in the hundreds or anything remotely like that. But it'll be a, a, a fair bit higher than that figure. Uh, very quickly on, on damage to houses in kibbutzim. Um, the, the gunmen were burning houses down because they were trying to smoke people out of their safe rooms. So when you see burned out houses, that quite often is the result of, of Hamas action. But when you see houses that are destroyed clearly by heavy weaponry, that are not burned, they're, they're simply flattened, then that would have been done by the Israeli army. Yeah, it's a very heavy story. It's very, it, I must say, it must have been grueling beyond belief to go through that kind of material. Yes, it was. I mean, you know, as I say, I watched over seven hours of it, and my, my, my colleague uh, or colleagues, um, you know, looked in detail at every death. 
Um, I think there's a source of enormous frustration, the, the amateurishness of Zaka, which we, we, we'll come to, this organization that the Israelis... Zaka is the um, organization in Israel which goes to terror atrocities or to public sort of disasters uh, and takes the book, looks after the dead, is that right? And prepares them for burial, yes, yeah. it's a religious thing. Uh, the, the Israeli government has this slightly unusual arrangement where it farms this out to them, partly for religious reasons, I think. Um, and they are an organization of ultra-Orthodox uh, volunteers. And I think the first thing to say is they were just overwhelmed on October the 7th. They were not prepared for something on this scale. They were overwhelmed and I think they were quite often traumatized. Um, but but it, the bodies were not properly photographed in situ, not properly recorded. It's enormously frustrating for, for the families of many of the dead that they, they simply don't know exactly how, when, where their, their relatives died. So you know, the work we've done, minutely picking apart I think there's this frustration that we can't come up with a more specific figure for the number killed by Apache helicopters and Israeli tanks and so on. But it, it's just impossible because the data, uh, d data just isn't there. So was it was Zaka making honest mistakes, or in, because it was overwhelmed, or because quite a lot of their statements were absolutely you know, like twenty baby, two piles of ten de dead babies. Just run through. Yes, I know Zaka and the United Health Zala is another organization. You also have Israeli military officials. Now, they, they, they give a lot of information that turns out to be false. I think to, there's an element to which they're traumatized, they're overwhelmed, they don't really understand what they're looking at, they're not forensically trained. There is an element of that. But when Colonel Vach stands in front of that house in Berry, where, where all of the hostages were actually killed, almost certainly by the Israeli army, and police. He stands in front of that house and said, eight babies burned and killed. I took them out with my own hands. There were no babies, no babies at all. Now, you know, you can draw your own conclusions as to why he's saying that, but it's very hard to see it as, an, as a, a mistake. So why do Zaka and the other, um, and the, the Israeli military tell these stories? And there's confusion and, and genuine mistakes, yes, but, but others, it's, it's clear they're not true. It's clear they're not true. Um, now, we have a, a sequence in the film where you see Benjamin Netanyahu thanking Zaka volunteers in December, thanking them for, for talking to the international media. And he effectively says, this is another front in the war, the information front. Um, Zaka also was an organization in trouble. Its founder had been... Um, found guilty of, of child sexual abuse. And there had been some funding scandals as well. It was an organization in trouble and it has raised a lot of money since October the 7th. And, um, you know, the various representatives of Zaka go on speaking tours and so on and they, they tell the stories of what happened on October the 7th, whether there is a correlation between the types of stories they tell and the amount of money they get. I, I don't know, that's for people to make their own judgment. One of the one last thing I really found very instructive about your film, uh, and this was the epic scale of the intelligence failure. It's not just what I, I knew we knew about, which was the warnings from Egypt, um, and the fact that you know that it was going on in plain sight. The tra training was going on in plain sight, and they would put the videos online. Yeah. That was quite, I, uh, but the fact that that two o'clock that morning, unusual activity was detected on October the 7th. Yes, I mean, it's hubris, isn't it? Um, I mean, there was, the Shin Bet met, they didn't just sort of uh, talk, have sort of a telephone conversations, did they actually have a... Well, I, or it might have been a Zoom meeting. Might have been sure, a, a Zoom meeting. But it was, it was Shin Bet and, and military intelligence yeah. that they met up. No, I mean, as so often with these things, it's not lack of information. It's a bit like 9-11. You know, in retrospect, you could join all the dots. Uh, the information was there. It's the interpretation of the evidence. Now, the Israelis had, or reportedly had, the Hamas plan. Uh, but just because people have plans for something and have prepared to do, do something doesn't mean they're going to do it. And the Israeli, I, mean, the, I think the Israeli analysis was they were whistling in the dark. This was Hamas keeping its courage up, you know, sort of motivating the troops and, and what have you. They thought Hamas was contained. They thought Hamas was neutered. They, they had this meeting at two in the morning or three in the morning, where, uh, uh, which is important, obviously, the information they were getting was... But it's the young you know, spotters along the fence, who are often young women, who were... were we're saying, hang on, there's something going on here. And it was significant enough to have a meeting, but then they didn't put on an, uh, out a general yes. alert. What is unforgivable when you have word that something's going on is not even to have raised to alert level one.
There was no alert level sent out at all, okay? Um, now, okay, they might have underestimated it, they might have thought, well, we don't take this seriously, but they could have at least put the word around the, the numerous military bases around the Gaza Strip, that, you know, just be, be on alert. And they didn't. The, the music festival, you know, crucially continued through the night and was still going on at six in the morning when, when all this kicked off. And, um, and at the various military, you can see it, a lot of them are killed in their beds. Yeah, and you had that footage also of, sort of, of uh, armoured cars, which hasn't... Yeah. So they haven't been and they're started absolutely up. taken by surprise. It's a total shock to them. Which, given that Shin Bet and military intelligence had enough information that they were talking to each other in the middle of the night, that there are then soldiers four hours later who are killed in their beds is unforgivable, really. No, I, I think your film is, will become one of the definitive accounts of what happened. Why was it left to you, Al Jazeera? to make this film and not done by the, you know, the Sunday Times Insight unit could have done something. I don't know, it's a, it's a good question. BBC I'm, Verify, which is, that's what it's apparently you know, about, et cetera. Yes. What's going on there? I don't know, and I don't know. I mean, would 20, 30 years ago, would this film, type of film be made? I, I, think, I think quite possibly. It fits in with this, I mean, you know, I, you and I have been mainstream media journalists most of our lives. I've made over 20 dispatches, you've made many dispatches. I think on the whole, we, we haven't f felt ourselves censored. You know, when we've tackled phone hacking or, or uh, the war in Afghanistan, which I did in the war in Iraq, I've never felt myself censored. Western media has a peculiar problem with, with covering Israel. It, there's just a peculiar conceptual problem it struggles with. And, um, you know, I, I'm not one of these people who thinks you can never believe a word these buggers say and they're all in a conspiracy to deceive us. I don't believe that. But they do struggle to cover Israel. And the fact that there's been total media silence about the very significant discoveries yeah. uh, in your film tells us a great well, deal. And we come back to the previous thing you and I worked together on, which is the Labour Files, where you have the same thing. Now, there's, <laughs> you know, part of what you're revealing is the inadequacies of the media, so it's perhaps not surprising that the media d decides not to cover it. Yes, we, yes, I was in your, I, I gave evidence, didn't I? It was, it was a voice in your film, you voice, yes. which was about um, the, the truth about the Corbyn, uh, the Corbyn anti-Semitism crisis. Yes, I mean, the Labour Files was a series based on a leak of the entire Labour Party server to, to Al Jazeera. And it was a re-examination of uh, the Corbyn years and the, the, the failings of, main, of traditional media in covering the Corbyn years. My specific film, for which you gave an interview, uh, was uh, offering an alternative perspective on the anti-Semitism crisis. Above all, drawing on, on Jewish people. Most of the voices in that film were Jewish people who, who supported Israel and crucially don't support, sorry, Jewish people who supported Corbyn uh, and, and crucially who don't uh, support Israel, which is what actually turned out to be the key determinant. And also Palestinian voices, uh, which just never got found their way into the debate at all. Yeah, and once again, I, I felt that a lot of what was disclosed in your film uh, is just ignored by, and it does upset me. You know, I kind of, when I went into the British journalism, I believed we were, our job was to be fearless yeah. and tell difficult truths yeah. and to tell the truth That's right. as best as we could get yeah. at it. Yeah. And the, the, those, the, 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 your film at, about October the 7th and then your film earlier about the Labour file suggests that is quite the opposite, that the, that the media has an aversion to difficult truths uh, and will either ignore it or seek to discredit it or and uh, we're talking about very, you know, the, the great media organisations of our age too, like the BBC or the mainstream broadsheet newspapers in our country, and so on. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? You're a conservative. I'm not, but I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly lefty. And and I, and I think, you know, we're, neither of us are people who are predisposed to think that there's a great conspiracy of the media to to deceive people. And I, but I think the motivation of yourself and me in in looking at the Corbyn years and, and, and looking at this story is just a frustration with how bad the journalism is. You know, it's just terrible journalism. It's, I think you used a phrase earlier on about it's herd mentality, isn't it? There is a herd mentality. And then there's also just a, a, a basic 
conceptual problem with Israel. I mean, when you, when you went back to the Corbyn thing, basically they redefined anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism. I mean, it was fairly simple. And once you'd done that, of course you saw anti-Semites everywhere because a lot of, you know, people who, who take the view of Amnesty International Human Rights Watch and the Israeli Human Rights Organization, Betselem, that Israel is, is an apartheid state. If you take that view, you're, you're going to be hostile to Zionism. And if you have redefined hostility to Zionism as anti-Semitism, yes, of course, you're going to find anti-Semites everywhere. The other thing, actually, is that I think something has changed in our national discourse. If you go back 20 to 30 years, there was, a, there was an appetite for difficult films which would reframe events. And now it's all, there's an appetite for films which, or re reporting which simply amplifies the existing Yes, people narrative. seem to like to be very nervous of something which challenges the prevailing narrative, don't they? It's, it's quite strange. Um, which is one reason why the world needs... To watch my film. To watch <laughs> October the 7th. Yeah. And to read, I would say, Middle East Eye. And the other uh, outlets which you mentioned, mention them again, the ones that Yes, I mean, the about. ones that I've re relied on heavily, particularly in, or, or, you know, the ones who alongside us were re-exploring the sexual violence issue. It's The Intercept did really excellent work. Yes Magazine, I'm not quite sure who they are actually, but they produced a very long, very good piece. Mondo Vise, Grey Zone, and Electronic Intifada. Haaretz, which is a left-wing Israeli newspaper, did some good stuff as well. And um, it's been really fascinating telling the, this conversation, not just telling us only about October the 7th, harrowing though that information is, but also about the wider media coverage of, of, of what has gone on ever since. Thank you very much. Thank you.